Thank you. Wow. That's uh, a very tough act to follow. I felt like I was watching Star Trek there. It's amazing. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name's James Goodman. Uh, it's really nice to see you all here today. Thank you for coming. Um, I've got an important question. Does anyone in the room have the hots for me? <laughs> no? That's awkward. Um, <laughs> there's a, a big timer down here. It says I've got 15 minutes to go. <laughs> all right. Now I've got that out of my system. The hots I'm really talking about is uh, higher order thinking skills. And the context here is delivering higher order thinking skills in the age of AI uh, to university students. Um, so that's the topic I want to talk about today. In terms of boundaries, well, AI is either a marmite to you, you either love it or you don't. There's a sort of boundary here. And I want to prove that we can deliver higher order thinking skills in the age of AI. Um, and to do that, I'm going to look at four teaching and learning theories and models from the last century. Oop, that's jumped ahead. <laughs> from the last century. Um, and the context is this. So the context of the middle picture is our current students. Are we delivering the higher order thinking skills to our current students? And of course, those current students are going to go to the workplace and they're going to use AI in the workplace. So the skills that we're teaching them here, are they going to be good enough for the workplace? And the picture on the left-hand side there is the prospective students. Are students going to want to come to university to learn those higher-order thinking skills when you've got AI tools in your pocket that can do seemingly magic? So as I said, I'm going to do four theories or models from the last century to try and prove that we do have the higher-order thinking skills. But before we get there, this is kind of how some of us might see artificial intelligence, AI in the world, in the wild west of education. Some of you might be feeling the volatility of uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity of AI. What are we going to do with it? How do we change things? Some of you might be going through the stages of grief, denial. It'll all just blow over, I hope. Um, anger, well, it's changing my world. We don't like change. Bargaining, well, maybe there's going to be some kind of regulation or policy that will ban AI and people won't have to use it. Depression, as you realize, those sort of things aren't really going to happen. We're kind of looking for the emperor's new clothes. What got us here today in terms of teaching education? Is it going to get us there tomorrow with AI in the room? So the first one, if you're an educator, you'll know this one. It's called Bloom's Taxonomy. And it's created by Benjamin Bloom in 1956. And it starts on the left-hand side with knowledge on the bottom and then comprehension. And as you go further up the pyramid, you've got the higher order thinking skills there of evaluation and synthesis. But in the late 1990s, along came the internet. And Bloom's Taxonomy had to be revisited or revised. And so in 56, it was a noun. It was passive. And by 2001, it was active. So knowledge became remembering. Comprehension became, can't see it there, understanding. <laughs> but right at the top there, the significant change there was creativity. We realized that with the internet, the creativity is probably the most important thing. Now, I'm relatively new to teaching. So I came to teaching at the university about six years ago. And there was a colleague in the department who was retiring. And I come from an IT technology background. I was talking to him about technology in education. And he said something that's stuck with me ever since. He said, James, in academia, you only get wiser by asking the right question. So right now, technology is just a tool. But the most creative element is the human being who can creatively ask the right question. So we find ourselves in 2024 with AI. And understanding how to ask the right question is still valid. If you ask AI tools a dumb or simple question, it'll give you a dumb or simple answer. If you ask a more sophisticated question, it's going to give you a more sophisticated answer. So we should be teaching students the creativity of learning how to ask the right question. So no changes are needed in our higher order thinking skills. The creative element is still important. The next one from um, 1954, so a couple of years later by Guilford, was convergent 
and divergent thinking skills. So convergent divergent thinking skills is the ability to generate multiple solutions or ideas in response to a problem or a question. So we think about it, the best way to describe this is maybe one of those children's toys where you've got little blocks and you have to fit the blocks into the right shapes and so on and so forth. You see a child doing, they're going to try every block, every shape possible, might bash it in. But the point is, convergent thinking is you've got as many, many different ideas or solutions and it converges to a single solution. And it's finding the best possible solution to a problem. This process of innovation is important. Now, in the context of artificial intelligence, there's some research to suggest that artificial intelligence does the same thing. It goes out and gets all the right answers. It comes back and gives you a, a single solution. We have this problem, though. At the moment, AI is getting human-generated answers and bringing back human-generated content. But after a while, if a human uses the AI generated content, we get what's called AI or AI jurism. So AI jurism is a confluence of AI, artificial intelligence, and plagiarism. So we'll find that the AI is copying from humans, and then it's copying, the humans copying from AI, and AI is copying from AI. There's a really interesting paper that was published last year called The Curious Decline in Linguistic Diversity, which actually tested this. It tested the results that come back from artificial intelligence without creative human input start to decline. So the important thing here is the engagement with the AI is the human component is so important in that engagement with AI. If human beings, if we stagnate in the creativity, well, where else is artificial intelligence going to get the creative thoughts from? So humans are needed to generate the original and new content and they always will be. The next model, a bit later on, by Flavel, metacognition. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. That was René Descartes in 1637. The term metacognition refers to the ability to think about one's own thinking. It's to reflect in the process of that thinking process. It includes knowing when and how to use specific strategies uh, in learning and solving problems. It's got three main components. It's got the planning, the monitoring, and the evaluating. If we think about how we set an assignment for a student, we ask them to write, say, a 2,000-word essay. So their plan is to, continue, to, to, to create 2,000 words. Their focus is to create 2,000 words. So in terms of what they're going to do, possibly, is go to artificial intelligence tools, and it can instantly generate those 2,000 words. The problem is the monitoring of that content or output is important, and the evaluation of that content is important. So we should be teaching students the reflective teaching, the reflective skills of metacognition, which is to reflect on the content that's being pumped out by artificial intelligence. So thinking about thinking, and the discipline of thinking is not a new discipline. And I think working with artificial intelligence has become even more important to think about that metacognition, that process of dealing with artificial intelligence. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute or two that we are going into the next phase of artificial intelligence. It's going to be called artificial superintelligence. It's going to be almost indistinguishable from human beings. Now, depending on who you talk to, that could be three or four years from now. It might be three or four weeks from now. It might be three or four months from now. But what at the point we reach, if we're in the world of artificial superintelligence and the things that we are dealing with are almost indistinguishable from human beings, it kind of brings me to the final theory here, the theory of the mind. That was Pembach and Woodruff in 1970. Eight. <laughs> Too small here. So in psychology, the theory of the mind is where two human beings, when they interact, they attribute emotions and beliefs and facts to one another. A good way to explain this is imagine you're a brand new student going to a university. And half the lecturers at the university can only tell you the truth. The other half can only lie to you. 
So you go to your first lecture. At the end of your first lecture, you go and see your lecturer and say, were you telling the truth? And the lecturer says, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> in the real world, you would do the Socratic kind of questioning and answering. In the real world, you would ask the lecturer questions to ascertain whether they were telling the truth or lying. So imagine the superintelligence that you maybe just accept everything it says to you. The ability to push back and to ask those questions, to verify whether the information artificial intelligence is giving you, to test it or challenge it, that's also quite important. But all these skills I've been talking about have been around since the 1900s. They're higher order thinking skills. So I think kind of learning and teaching our students to, to lean in to artificial intelligence could provide longer term benefits. Earlier today we had us talk about the human in the loop. Putting the human in the loop is really, really important. And doing this consciously and with planned intent is important. Right now, today, we can say, oh, you know, AI does hallucinations, and, you know, it pumps out rubbish, and the facts are wrong. But again, there's been recent research, literally over the last 12 months, to suggest that it's got better. It's hallucinating less, and the truth or the, the content has got better. So if we project that forwards, people's reliance on it is going to increase. But their ability to question actively question and have an engagement with it. That's the important thing. So the universities, the higher order thinking skills, we do that, interacting with lecturers. But the lecturer is going to be replaced by artificial intelligence, and I just don't mean here at university, I mean in the workplace. When they rely on those tools in the workplace to make those critical management decisions, if they're not interrogating it or learning how to interrogate it, then we have a bit of a problem. So, in summary, if you're feeling kind of in an existential crisis with AI, if you're feeling all those stages of grief, just turn to the tried and tested models of higher order thinking skills. I believe we can deliver these with the existing tools that we have today. One last thought, just to leave you with, is that all the theories I've shown you here, the artificial intelligence tools know about already. They don't get turned off, they're on 24-7. They have millions and millions of people providing input. And they never fall asleep in lectures. <laughs> so, if you did have the hots for me, come and see me afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>